Well, today we are continuing new chapter here, chapter 24, and we're talking about marriage and divorce. Uh, we've got uh, six, seven, six articles here, so hopefully we'll be able to breeze through them pretty quickly. Some of them are actually pretty short. Uh, but before we begin, I just want to, by way of introduction, I want to make clear again, and most of us I think probably know this, that marriage is a, a gift of, of God to, to humanity. It's God gave marriage to us, to the human race. Uh, God commanded it, he ordained it, uh, and he instituted it, which, which means it's, it's not been given to us to do with as we please. It's not something that we can uh, take, walk into lightly. It's not something that we should try to dissolve quickly. And it's not something that we should try to turn and, and form into something that we find uh, pleasing or acceptable. Uh, God established certain principles to govern both marriage and divorce. And, and both of them uh, are regulated by the Bible. We need to remember that. Uh, and of course, in today's day and age, that's been forgotten, that's been ignored, uh, and we just we don't have to look very far to see how both marriage and divorce have been um, uh, used and taken advantage of and, and completely twisted in ways that God has never, uh, never intended. Uh, so of course, we can see how that's sin uh, playing out. And we'll, we'll touch base on some of those things as we go along. Uh, again, this confession does a pretty good job of, of uh, talking about containing all those things. So the first uh, article here it discusses just the design of marriage. It's a simple sentence here. Marriage is to be between one man and one woman. Neither is it lawful for any man to have more than one wife, nor for any woman to have more than one husband at the same time. Uh, so here, this is something that, that I think has been paramount to the biblical doctrines. Uh, marriage is between one man and one woman. Neither is it lawful uh, for them to have more than one spouse at the same time. Um, and you know, one cornerstone text here is that Matthew chapter 19, which you see listed there. Uh, Matthew 19 verses 4 through 6, Jesus is having a discussion with uh, some Pharisees. Uh, no, I think it's with some Sadducees. And he answers and said to them, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And so here we see that even Paul, or excuse me, Jesus talks about the, that marriage is, is between one man and one woman. And essentially this document is saying, or this article here says, polygamy is not appropriate. Um, and so you know, religious denominations, especially Christian denominations that uh, put out or, or, or say that polygamy is, is allowed, very clearly go against what Jesus himself says. You know, the two become one flesh. He didn't say the many become one flesh. He didn't say they all become one flesh. He said very clearly that, you know, a man will leave his mother and father and join himself to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Uh, two to one. So it's again, one man, one woman, that's their relationship. It's not many partners that are involved in there. Um, so again, this article just very clearly states that the design of marriage is is monogamy. That's, that's what God has designed uh, from, from eternity. Uh, any questions on that one? Again, pretty straightforward, simple article there. All right, the second article reads, uh, it's talking about the purpose of marriage. Marriage was ordained for the mutual help of husband and wife, for the increase of mankind with a legitimate issue, and of the church with a holy seed, and for preventing of uncleanliness. So there's three things that, uh, that this article lists as the purpose of marriage. And I do want to talk about all three of them briefly here. The first is that marriage was ordained for the mutual help of husband and wife. And I want to underline and, and stress the mutual word there. It's the mutual help of husband and wife. Um, it's not, you know, we, when we read, and we're going to read some, some texts here that have been taken out of context to especially put one person, specifically the wife, in submission to the husband in a slavish sense. Since 1643, the Westminster Divines have always understood that marriage is a mutual help. You know, it's not the, 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 the wife is not a, a servant of the husband to do what he pleases and he doesn't have to do anything for her. 
That's never been the biblical perspective of things. Now, there are denominations and, and, and Christians out there who believe that, and they are in error when they believe that. They have believed something that is false, and that is a sin. And so here we understand very clearly that marriage was ordained for the mutual help of husband and wife. Uh, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, here we see the very first instance of, of marriage. And of course, if you, know, if you think about this, this is the creation narrative in Genesis chapter 2. And if you remember, up to this point, God had always said, this is a good thing. You know, it was morning and evening, and it was good the first day, the second day. Everything was good. The first time you hear of something not being good is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, where the Lord says, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And so we, we see here that, that help is very clearly what's, what's needed here. It's a, a, a suitable helper. And what, what, is, what does it mean to be suitable? Well, thankfully, the Psalms give us a little clue. Uh, Psalms 46 verse 1 uh, hints us at what that help is. And, and it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And so we see that from, from the earliest chapters of, of the Bible, the, the suitable partner, the suitable helper for man has really been someone who, I, I hate to say, takes the place of God because no one can take the place of God. But here God recognized that, ma that man was alone and he needed a suitable helper. And who's the best helper out there? Well, it's God. Well, God has a, a different type of relationship. He knows, he, he knew about the fall. Of course, you know, the fall wasn't something that was uh, unknown to God. He, he, it hadn't happened yet, but he certainly knew it was going to happen. And so God established that a suitable partner for man would be his wife, someone who can, can fill a role someone who takes a godly position. And so when we think about the marriage relationship between husband and wife, the, the, you know, I think there's probably the, the saying out there, and maybe it's become cliche, but I think it's always important uh, that when, when there's a, a marriage relationship, it's not just two people that are involved, there's a third one, and it's God. If God is not in that relationship, whether the husband is not a godly husband or the wife is not a godly wife, then there's going to be strife. There's going to be contention. One of these people is probably going to try to make the spouse into something that they want. But a godly spouse recognizes their duty as husband and wife and shows that we are trying to help our partner become godly as well. That's how we are in a relationship with one another. Because again, the suitable help that Adam needed was someone to maintain, help him maintain godliness. Uh, of course, again, God again, is thinking about the upcoming fall. And so Paul takes this in Ephesians chapter 5, where he really... Uh, dives into it and unpacks what it means uh, for this mutual help. In uh, verses 22 and 23, Paul says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church. And in verse 25, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so here, Paul takes that, that role of what God has established as a suitable helper for man. And here he explodes it and, and, and explains it what it's supposed to be. Now, of course, secular ears hear this and they stop at verse 22 where it says, wives be subject to your own husbands. And they start freaking out, waving their arms around, hey, feminism this, feminism that. Shut up and read the rest of the passage, okay? <laughs> and I hate to be blunt, but that's how, that's how often the text can be twisted. You, you stop at one part and you never take in the rest of the context. Yeah, if you stop, if Paul had stopped at verse 22, wives be subject to your own husbands and to the Lord, and said nothing else, I'd be upset too. I'd be mad. I wouldn't be a Christian, probably because of something like that. Thankfully, Paul didn't stop there. And so when you take in the full context, what Paul is essentially saying is that wives are subject to the husband just as uh, the church is subject to, the, to Christ, to the Lord. Um, this is a, a wonderful relationship. Maybe let's take it backwards and, and start with the husband. You know, he says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. He tells us what that love is looks like what that what how did christ love the church well he gave himself for her he he went to the cross for her and so there's a sense of sacrifice that is uh 
necessary in order to be a godly husband. Um, there's a sense of, of being willing to, to die for your spouse, uh, to be willing to, to uh, go to the ends of the earth to, to preserve and protect uh, your spouse. And certainly that's something that, that husbands should, should do. And Unfortunately, we see today that some husbands aren't like that. This, this notion of biblical masculinity has, um, well, that's offensive to some people. Uh, they, they, you know, we, we talk about things like chivalry, or you've heard of things like chivalry. Um, there's, it, it's more than just chivalry from a medieval sense. There's a, a biblical sense of what the husband, his duty is to the wife. And, and one of those duties is to, is to protect, to, to preserve, to, to be willing to sacrifice himself for her. Um, and, and of course, that's easier said than done, but it's also easier done when you have a, a godly wife. So we'll talk a little bit later in a, in a couple few articles, but uh, with unequally yoked, this is one of the reasons why it's always good to have a, a spouse who is a believer. Um, you know, it's much easier to uh, for the husband to be willing to to sacrifice himself for a wife who who also knows what her role is in in, in the scheme of the church, in the scheme of of um, of the biblical doctrine of marriage. And so that's why, in light of that that love that Christ has shown for the church. So Christ died for the church. Let's just stick with the church part first. Christ died for the church. That's how much he loves her. And so the church, in response to that love, loves Christ back. You know, that's what Jesus said. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The greater love has no man than this, and to lay down his life for his friends. You can go on and on. I mean, John and 1 John, I mean, all those letters are all about how Christ has exemplified his love for the church. And when the church, the disciples, when believers see that love and experience that love, we respond back with a love of our own. And so here we see that it's a mutual relationship. It's a mutual love. And so now when we see that, that's the, the cosmic understanding of the church in Christ. Now we bring it down and try and understand it in the marriage relationship. Now, of course, husbands are not Christ's and wives are not the church, but there is still a, a, a sense of, of duty that each has toward the other. Uh, the, the, the husband will never save the wife because, again, that's Christ's work. Christ is the one who saves. But the husband must still serve and protect and, and love his wife. Um, and so, you know, again, when people look to this and say, wives, submit to your husband, and, you know, and there's other passages that people like to use, and, and so they essentially say, well, I can beat my wife, or I can, you know, you're, you're being a bad wife, you're talking back to me. That would very clearly go against what is said here. Uh, if, if a husband is abusive, he is not loving his wife. That is not, do you think Jesus loved the church by being abusive? <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, and so we see that, that when, we, when we try to understand, again, it's not in that same cosmic sense, but a husband has a duty to his wife, and then the wife has duties to her husband. Um, in, in Proverbs chapter 31, that's that great uh, passage on uh, the, the, I guess, the, the wife, the, the wise wife. And it goes through and lists what, what she does. And it's, it's not just simply, she's not just a homemaker, which is, again, what people often think of when they think of this scene is that the wife is at home doing the dishes and cooking and cleaning all day and she doesn't do anything else. If you read Proverbs 31, she does a lot. It, what, what, I think I can't remember exactly what verse it is, but in, in there he says uh, Solomon says if she sees a pro, she sees a, a ripe land and she buys it, she 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 knows what um, what what will benefit the family. She knows what uh, you know. She makes these economic decisions on behalf of of the family. Uh, she knows what will be good for her family, for her wife, and for her children. She's aware of of their needs, and and if there is a need, she finds a way to meet it. You know, she's she's not a a slave at home. She has a tremendous amount of of work and responsibility within that homemaking. It's actually really funny. I think it's in First Timothy, where uh, Jesus or Paul is also talking about. Um, uh, the wives, the duties of wives. And, uh, and in there, he references, in the Greek, he talks about the wife as the oiko despotes. And that's what he calls the oiko despotes. Now, there's a word in there you probably have, he have heard of. Uh, probably sounds familiar. Is there a word that you sound familiar to you in that word? Oiko despotes? How about the word despot? despot. 
Yeah. And so, and that's, that's, so, so it's a compound word. And the other word, oiko, we actually, we also know that word, we get the word economy from that word. So essentially what Paul is saying is that the wife is the house despot. Oikos just means house. She, she's the house, she's the manager of the house. She, she manages the household. I mean, that's one of her responsibilities. Again, she's not some slave who works in the back, uh, does all the cleaning, and the husband eats, drinks, and gets drunk, and you know, does all, all these things, and just has sex with her. I mean, no, it's, it's a mutual relationship. And, and, it's, and she has a lot more responsibility than feminists want us to think the Bible says. Um, you know, she's she, the, she's the oiko despote. She's the house despot. Betsy loves it when I call her the house despot <laughs> because there's a lot of responsibility that, that is on, on the wife's shoulders. So again, that's, we, we saw it went off a little track there. Um, that's how marriage is ordained for the mutual help of husband and wife. The second thing that marriage is for, marriage was ordained for the increase of mankind. And so there's this, there's this notion that, you know, there is procreation involved. Uh, this is what God told all the other creatures, and, and this is certainly what God told Adam and Eve in the garden. Psalms 127, verses 3 through 5, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is a man whose quiver is full of them. And so there's this notion that uh, it, it really is a blessing to, to have children. Um, now, of course, we know that sometimes physically having children is, is difficult for some folks. People in the Bible were barren. Um, you know, some of them, were, their wombs were open, but many probably were not. And so, you know, that's why we have things like adoption, which is a fantastic service. Even if, even if you can't have physical children, you can still adopt. Um, there are ways of having children that, uh, even if they're not your own, uh, because of one of the things that marriage does is it... it ordained to have an increase of mankind, to have children, to have, uh, to rear families. And again, that's a, a heavy responsibility too. Um, you know, it's, and you know, we, it's not really mentioned here, but, um, raising a family, biblically speaking is, is a challenge. Uh, it's, it's hard, uh, but it's our duty, especially if we are believing parents, if we're Christian parents, we have a duty to our children to raise them up in the fear of the Lord. I mean, Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, talking about what, you know, the Shema that God tells, Hear, O Israel, I am the Lord your God, the Lord am one. Uh, and essentially, he talks about what, what the responsibility of the parents are to the children. They're supposed to, to you know, the talk about the law in the morning when they rise up and when they go down and sleep at night. They're supposed to write it on their hands. It, it, he's not just limiting that to, that's not some Old Testament gibberish that we don't have to worry about anymore because now we're in the New Testament. Absolutely not. We still have a responsibility as Christian parents to instill in our children the, the truth of the gospel. Um, now, we can't guarantee they're going to go to heaven because, one, we can't do that. We can't guarantee they're always going to be Christians and believers in their life. That They have a responsibility at that point. But our responsibility as Christian parents is to give them the right understanding of the word. And so that's all part of increasing uh, our mankind. It's not just having children just to have children. It's to have children for the, the, the purpose of growing, growing the church in that sense. Uh, and then the third thing, marriage was ordained for preventing of uncleanliness. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, this is really where um, all that comes from. Uh, and we're going to unpack all this in next summer because I'm actually going to do a series on 1 Corinthians. But in chapter 7, one of the things that Paul is addressing in the church in Corinth is sexual immorality. And he says in verse 2, But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. And a little bit later in verse 9, But if they do not have self-control, let them marry. For it is excuse me, better to marry than to burn with passion. So Paul recognizes that there's a... Well, let me back up and say, Paul actually says in this chapter, singleness is, is a good thing. 
Uh, Paul isn't, you know, he, he doesn't want people to go uh, jumping headlong in the marriage. He actually says living the single life is okay. He even says in this chapter, be as I am. I would prefer you to be as I am. So he's talking, he's unmarried. Uh, he's saying, you know, focus so you can give all your attention and all your energy to, to the Lord and to God. So he's, he's, he's encouraging singleness for as long as, um, as possible. If someone, you know, you don't have to be married. You don't have to go into a relationship. Try and live the single life for a little while. But, and then so in light of that, he says, but because of immoralities, each man is to then have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. So Paul recognizes that there is sexual temptation in the world, especially in the church in Corinth. I mean, it was, it was everywhere. Uh, in Corinth, they had things like uh, temple prostitutes. You know, that was part, if you, if you were worshiping these pagan gods, you would go and, and part of your religious ritual was to hire a prostitute in this in that temple uh, and that was that was okay that was fine that was look that was that was commonplace you know and and so here i mean and, and so paul recognizes hey there are immoralities that are surrounding the church and one of the things that paul stresses and that the bible stresses is that we need to maintain a purity of faith and because there's immoralities it's best that you know a man and his, and their you know a man and a wife they should stay together. You know he should each should have their own one man one wife. He's just again stressing that that uh, what was mentioned in the first article. But more than that, in verse nine, like I said, if they have if they do not have self control, so in this case he's talking to single people. If you're a single person and you and you don't have self control, you're burning with lust, you're burning with with the desires. Then then go ahead and marry. You know, find a suitable partner. Find someone who, who you can uh, enter into a covenant relationship with and, and who you can have. You know, and this is where, you know, the idea of sex, we don't talk about it in church, but sex is between a man and wife. Paul doesn't say that explicitly here, but that's what he's saying implicitly. If you, have, if you don't have self-control, if you're single and, and you, you, you want to go out there and have sex with everything, that's wrong. Have sex with your wife have sex with your husband. That's where sex is properly, um, properly expressed and experienced. Um, and so it's better, and as we said, it's better to marry than to burn with passion. And of course, to burn with passion is to let your lust, your desires to, to take over. And again, that, Paul doesn't, Paul's arguing against that. We need to let Christ take over our lives. We need to let his desires and his will be our will. If we are doing what we find pleasing, if we do what is, what is passionate to us in that, in that sense, then we're not pleasing God, we're, we're pleasing ourselves. And our goal should always be to please God. Again, we'll unpack all that hopefully next summer. But um, those are the three things that the Westminster Confession says that marriage was ordained for. Any, any thoughts on those? Or were, there, or were there any others you would add to that? You all have been married longer than I have. So, you know, there's, there's, I'm sure you've, you've experienced some things in your life. All right. We'll move on then to Article 3. Article uh, 3 is talking about um, uh, how marriage is, is to be preferenced. So uh, verse 3 here, or article 3, excuse me. It is lawful for all sorts of people to marry who are able with judgment to give their consent. Yet it is the duty of Christians to marry only in the Lord. And therefore such as profess the true reformed religion should not marry with infidels, papists, or other idolaters. Neither should such as are godly be unequally yoked by marrying with such as are notoriously wicked in their life or maintain damnable heresies. So first of all, there's, there's two things. There's a short sentence and a long sentence. And that first one there, it is lawful for all sorts of people to marry who are able with judgment to give their consent. And so if, if you know, back in the day there was argue against, you know, the mixing of the races, well, very clearly the Westminster Divines argue against that uh, race Ethnicity, that is not a defining or, or not a thing that, that would prevent a lawful marriage. Um, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, just the first part of that verse, uh, the author says, Marriage is to be held in honor among all. He says, Among all, not among some, not among many, but among all. Marriage is to be held in honor among them. Um, and so there's this notion that there's that it's it is lawful for all sorts of people to marry. You don't and, and you know you don't have to even limit it to race. You could talk about class. 
Um, you know, there in the medieval world, and certainly in, in this time, it was uh, unpopular for someone of a lower class to marry someone of a higher class. Uh, and certainly, you know, someone of a higher class would look down upon uh, someone, or you know, maybe their friends would look down upon them for marrying someone of a lower class. Here again, the Bible says class doesn't matter, race doesn't matter. Uh, that w- doesn't matter what type of person you are in that sense, what category you might have in, in society. Uh, marriage is not limited to, or, or you're not limited to who you can marry. It's very clear. Um, and then there is one limit on there in the sense that, you know, you at least have to be able to consent to being married. So that would be the, the, the so you can marry, it's lawful to marry anyone so long as there's consent. Uh, and so that's the other side of that too. You, you can't just force anyone to marry. And so things like um, arranged marriages are something that Christians should not do, should not partake in. Um, uh, and certainly things like fo- forced marriages, coerced marriages, or, or marriages for economic um, uh, stability or economic growth, or, you know, things like that, which of course many of the princes of Europe had, had been doing and, and continue to do since this date. Um, I think it was, uh, it was like Queen Victoria was related to half of the, the kings and queens in Europe uh, when she was on the throne. So uh, again, just you know, handing out cousins left and right. That's actually an unlawful use. I mean, unless they, you know, if they did consent, then it is lawful. But if they didn't consent, that would be an unlawful um, marriage in that sense. Uh, and then to draw from that, in Genesis chapter 24, um, Rebecca is, uh, well, in verse 24, 24 verse 51, uh, Rebecca is presented before uh, Abraham. Here's Rebecca before you. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son, uh, as the Lord has spoken. Um, and so it's not Abraham, but it's Abraham's servant. I misspoke. And so, and the servant went. And then so verse 57, um, they have a conversation there. And here, the uh, this is Rebecca's family. They said, we will call the girl and consult her wishes. So they, they, they consulted with Rebecca, and verse 58, they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? So will you go with Abraham's servant to be married to his son? And she said, I will go. If she said, I won't go, then we wouldn't have had this chapter in the Bible probably. Uh, and so there's this notion that consent is, is a necessary part of it. But again, you can marry whoever you want so long as there is consent. Uh, so it's open, but it is a little bit limited in that first sentence there. The second part of this sentence limits it within the, the Christian system. So again, this is why it's a benefit. Now, Paul and Peter will say it's not illegal to marry someone who's not a Christian, but your life will be a lot harder if you do. And so uh, here the Westminster Divines say, uh, such as profess the true reformed religion should not marry with infidels, papists, or other idolaters, marrying with such as are, as are notoriously wicked in their life, or maintain damnable heresies. Um, so in, you know, infidels, papists, about the, the Catholics there, and, and they, did, they didn't like them, uh, and idolaters, uh, there's this sense that um, if, if there's a, a, an unequal yokeness there, uh, it can cause some, some difficulty, because again, doctrine matters. Sound doctrine matters. The reason why this whole document is made is because these folks knew that doctrine matters. And I know they list the papists here, and they're not very favorable towards Catholics, and you know that's, that's their time period. I think today we are a little bit more uh, favorable. But even today, Catholic theology, Catholic doctrine is very different from the historic Reformed faith. You know, so even today, the Catholic catechism and the Westminster catechism differ strikingly. Um, and so, you know, while I wouldn't prevent a Presbyterian from marrying a Catholic, I would certainly, you know, if, I, if they came to me and wanted to seek, sought counseling, I would say you need to have a, a, a strong and a helpful, but probably a challenging conversation about your theology. Because those theologies, if, if that Catholic is serious about their, their Catholicity and that Presbyterian is serious about their Presbyterianism, at some point, their theology will clash, and they'll either fight or they'll consent, and both are not good. And so here we, we just have this sense that the Westminster Divines recognize that there are challenges when we are unequally yoked in that, in that sense. Um, from Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 2, and f- two through 5, 
When the Lord your God delivers them before you, talking about the uh, neighbors and the, the people surrounding Israel, and you defeat them, then you will surely utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show no favor to them. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. And of course, we don't have to look far in the Old Testament, and even the New Testament, and probably even in the, our, our world today, how someone who marries someone else who is not a believer, they can very easily and very quickly slip into heresy, slip into apostasy. They can be turned away from following God. Because that's, that's, that's the hard part. You know, it's, we talk about how the Christian life is, is it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. It's a simple message. It's a straightforward message. Uh, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's probably as simple as it gets from Jesus. But that's not an easy thing to do. It's so much easier to live in sin. It's so much easier because one, that's less that you have to you know, try and think about. Am I going to be pleasing God by my actions today? And it's easier because people around you are, will, will, oh, oh, well, you're fine. What are you, what are you, 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 you trying to please that God of yours? Why are you doing that? Why don't you just come and have some fun with us? Let's go get drunk. Let's go smoke some pot. Let's go have sex. You know, all these, whatever the world does with us. Throw, you know, let's go gamble our money away. Well, you know, we, we want to think about what is pleasing to God. But it's much easier to just go with the flow than to go against the grain. Uh, it's much easier on, 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 on people's motions and our lives, but it's very clearly that's not what God wants. God wants us to be countercultural. God wants us to go against the grain of wickedness. Uh, otherwise, we will very easily fall into it. So that's why God has this admonition against intermarriage uh, with, uh, with, pagan, with pagan peoples. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16, Paul says something similar. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? So righteousness and lawlessness. Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a, a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Um, and so there's this notion that uh, Paul recognized if you're going to be pursuing a, a uh, I think he's speaking generally too about just relationships in general, but I think he would certainly say if you're going to seek a, a marriage partner relationship, a lifelong monogamous relationship, be discerning. Don't bind yourself with someone who is unrighteous. Um, and, and here the Westminster Divines go on to say, uh, marrying such as are notoriously wicked in their life or maintain damnable heresies. So if we were to say, well, I'm, I can't marry a sinner. Well, you're going to be celibate for the rest of your life. <laughs> because we're, we're, we're all sinners. And, and so, you know, for that ambitious young Christian who's like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to marry a sinner. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're going to die a, uh, an angry old man who's lonely. Um, and so the reality is, is people do sin. I, I think that's, that is true. That's a biblical truth. What the Westminster Divines are, are saying here, again, it's, it's those, we, we want to we be discerning in our relationships to to stay away from, and I hate to say it that way, but we want to stay away from people who are notoriously wicked in their life or maintain damnable heresies, as to, you know, to quote the Westminster Confession. And again, that's what Paul is getting at here. What does a, a believer have uh, in common with an unbeliever? Well, really nothing. Even though you might look the same and sound the same and work at the same place and do all the same things and have all the same taste, the reality is if you're a believer and that person's an unbeliever, you have nothing in common. And that's, you know, Paul asks all these questions, but the way he asks this question, the answer is obvious. Nothing. You know, what, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Nothing. What harmony has Christ with Billy out? Nothing. You know, and, and so uh, again, Paul makes very clear that we need to be careful and discerning when we are pursuing our, our partners. Now, Peter will say in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, if a person is bound to an unbeliever, okay, we have to remember that when the church was starting, not everyone was a Christian. And so it was, it was very common for one person, a spouse, 
to be a believer, and most often it was the woman. You know, Christianity was notorious back in the first century for being the religion of women and slaves. Uh, and so it, 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 in Peter's context, he's writing about a, a woman who's a Christian, who is, who's a believer, and her husband's not a believer. Uh, but I think we can explode this to anyone who is in that relationship. Um, there needs to be some respect and purity in that relationship in order to be a gospel witness. That's what Peter's encouraging these believing wives to do is, you know, your husband might be uh, an idolater. He might be someone who is a pagan and doesn't believe in Christ, um, but respect him. You, you know, you, you still owe, you still owe responsibility to him as, as his husband. Um, now, if he tells you to do something that's against God, maintain your religious purity. You know, tell him that you, you can't do that. Um, because you you have a you're you're purchased by the blood of Christ. He's talking about what we what the, we're supposed to do in our relationship. So we respect the other, even if our partner is not a believer. But we maintain the purity of the gospel uh, because that bears witness to to the gospel itself. Hopefully, that unbelieving spouse will see the the devotion and the righteousness that's in the believing spouse, and they will begin asking the questions. Well, why are you doing that? What, what is it about this Jesus that, that encourages you to do these things? And then boom, the door's open for evangelism. You see how wonderful that can be? So that's a great, so while, again, while it's not illegal to marry someone who's not a Christian, it is strongly encouraged not to do that because that would make your life harder. But again, if, you, if someone is married to an unbeliever, that's not grounds for divorce. And, uh, and we'll talk about divorce in a, in a couple articles. Any questions on, on that one? What was that article three? All right, article four talks about the limits of marriage. Marriage ought not to be within the degrees of consanguinity. I knew I was gonna mess that one up. <laughs> marriage ought not to be within the degrees of consanguinity or affinity forbidden by the word. Nor can such incestuous marriages ever be made lawful by any law of man or consent of parties, so as those persons may live together as man and wife. The man may not marry any of his wife's kindred nearer in blood than he may of his own, nor the woman of her husband's kindred nearer in blood than of her own. So here, the, again, there, there are limits to, to marriage. Again, this is biblically defined limits, not something that we put on. So marriage ought not to be within degrees of consanguinity or affinity forbidden in the word. So there's two things there. Uh, one, of course, consanguinity is you, you can't marry someone who you're related to. Um, that's what consanguin, consanguinity is. Um, yeah, so again, you can't marry your brother or sister. Um, the example here is uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Paul says to the church in Corinth, it's actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind that does not exist even among the Gentiles. And this is what that immorality is, that someone has his father's wife. So in this case, it's a son is in a sexual relationship with his mother. You know, and so that's, you know, that's also looked down upon, you know, again, siblings. Um, I don't know how far they're willing to go because, you know, Christians have been marrying cousins for a long time. I don't know how close cousins are, but I think consanguinity means you can't marry someone who is of the same blood in that sense. Like you can't marry an immediate sibling. You can't marry a child or a parent. That's that's unlawful in the scriptures. And again, that's what Paul says here in, in 1 Corinthians 5, 1. Likewise, there are affinities forbidden by the word. Um, and, and this one's a, a big one today. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. Homosexuality is an affinity forbidden by the word. Now, homosexuality isn't the only one. Things like bestiality, we've talked about polygamy, uh, we've talked about consanguinity, uh, we've talked about, uh, there's other things in the, in the Bible that talk about, uh, what I said, I mentioned bestiality, um, uh, uh, adultery, uh, so having an adulterous relationship. So even if, 
if if you aren't married, but you're in a in a relationship with someone who is married, that's that's wrong. That's that's adultery. So that's that's not allowed in the Bible. Uh, that's that's not a biblical relationship. There, um, marriage is is only to be between one man, one woman forever, um, as long as they both shall live. And, and we'll talk about divorce in the next section, but uh, that's the design for marriage. And it's not to be between persons who are on the same bloodline. Uh, so, you know, again, you're not supposed to marry an immediate kin, uh, kin folk. Uh, marriage is, it is limited in that sense and forbidden in that sense as well. Um, and then it goes on and, and lists, you know, explain what, what that is. But uh, again, this is, this is the, the big one here. And again, this is very clearly what is not happening in the world today. Uh, and it's funny that, that even in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says that there's, there's a lot of sexual morality amongst the Gentiles. But in that church, there was things that they were doing even that the Gentiles wouldn't do, which again was a son with his, with his mother. Um, any questions of that? I think it's pretty straightforward and clear. Yes, ma'am. Well, even cousins mm -hmm. marry because we have uh, an example in our family. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember whether they were first cousins or second cousins, but when the children came along, I think it was the oldest son, he had a blood condition that mm -hmm. took his life pretty early. Mm -hmm. And I, I suspect that that was from the closeness yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it certainly happens. My paternal grandparents are, well, were first cousins. Um, and so it happens all the time. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily unlawful in the biblical sense, um, because it's not, it's not, I don't know how the, de how the Westminster Confession is defining consanguinity. I don't know how they're defining it, but I certainly, when I read Paul, it is very clear that what is not allowed is parent with their child uh, and consanguinity also means probably with siblings as well. Um, that's, that is uh, not allowed. So I, I don't think there's necessarily un, unlawful about cousins, but it can, like you said, produce problems down the line in terms of genetics, uh, which certainly in 1643, they didn't know anything about genetics, but um, God certainly did. And I think he, you know, he's certainly aware of that. Mm hmm This predates that, obviously. It does, yeah. Uh, and, you know, part of my brain says, well, if a man marries a transgender woman who's had an operation... Mm hmm To become woman. To become a woman. Yeah. Does that change anything here? Well, um, there's two questions there. Because one is... is transgender or gender dysphoria biblical and then can you can a person lawfully marry someone who is transgendered um i i don't think because you're right the transgender predates the bible and certainly predates this movement here um i don't i don't necessarily i mean i think what paul says here Yes, it does. Yeah, sorry, I misspoke. Yeah, um, you're right. But Paul does say here in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, in, in the list of people who, who, are, who don't inherit the kingdom of God are the effeminate. Now, I'm not really sure how he defines the effeminate. We, I'd have to go through and read what that is in the Greek and, and figure out. But, but certainly within Paul's world, the, the, I, while transgenderism, like we know it, you know, wanting to, to change operations, that, that might not have been around, but certainly um, tr transvestitism was, which is the cross-dressing cross is, how, is how we would say that today. Um, that was definitely around back then. And, and I think that's what Paul is getting at here is, is those who, who, especially in this case, he's talking about men who want to, uh, to dress like women, who act like women, they might not be, um, they might not be homosexual in the sense that they're attracted to men. They, they might be, but they're acting more effeminately dressing, cross-dressing. So, you know, I think, and, and that is something, you know, cross-dressing is something you, we kind of have to be a little bit careful about because every kid 
you know, I remember putting on my mother's shoes. Uh, Teddy has tried to put on Betsy's shoes. Is that cross-dressing? No, no. They're, they're just exploring their world. They're trying to figure out, you know, they, they, you know it, the, the son who sees his mother's bra, you know, they're curious about it. Or, you know, the, the daughter who sees her, her father's boxer briefs, you know, things like that. They're curious. They don't really know. It, it, that's not cross-dressing. Um, cross-dressing is, is more, I guess, that affinity. And that is where, you know, if, if we have, if we live into that desire, that's where transgenderism or gender dysphoria does become uh, a biblical issue. Uh, when, when it's something that you, you, you're trying to, essentially what, what, transgenderism, what transgenderism says is essentially you're saying to God, God, you made me wrong. You gave me the wrong anatomy. God never does anything wrong. God never does anything incorrect. That is... Uh, and I, I want to be careful and say it's a, I'm going to say it's a, a mental disorder, but I'm not saying it's a mental disorder in like a psychiatric sense, but it's a mental thing. It, a person thinks that they are the opposite gender that, that they're made physically. And that's a, that is a, a sin problem and something they'll have to address, especially if they're, if they're Christians, they need to wrestle with that and they need to come to, you know, a biblical understanding. But essentially what transgender says is God, you made me wrong. And that that is an unbiblical position uh, and, and something that is sinful. Now, to answer the, the marriage question, you know, if, if a person, so I'll just use the example that you use. So, so th say there's a Christian man and, and he, he, he falls in love or, you know, he comes to date this, this woman and she keeps from him that she's actually, you know, someone who had sex change, had the operations and, and became a woman, but was actually a man. If she keeps that from him, you know, that right there is a problem. You know, you know if you're willing to keep that a secret from someone you, you love, all right, well, well, what's really going on there? Um, but if she goes to the extent to marry him, you know, that could be, that will definitely cause some problems down the line. But I don't think that would necessarily be a sin, at least on, on his, on the Christian's part. Um, because he didn't know. Um, now, if someone does know and, and they make it known, and again, it, in that same situation, if, if that Christian knows and, and that person says, hey, I'm actually a, 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 a transsexual or whatever, a transgender and I had a sex change, you, you know, I think the Christian should rightly think about ending that relationship because that, theologically, that would cause problems down the line. Uh, and again, one of the concerns, you know, while the Westminster Divines talk, talk about the Catholics and Christians, there's still a sense of if someone has that worldview, it's going gonna, it's gonna to clash with a biblical worldview. So the Westminster Divines would probably say the same thing. They, they would not encourage that type of relationship. But you're right, that does, this predates transgenderism, the, the conversations. Any other questions? All right, we've got 10 minutes to discuss divorce, the last two articles. So Article 5 says, Adultery or fornication committed after a contract being detected before marriage giveth just occasion to the innocent party to dissolve that contract. In the case of adultery after marriage, it is lawful for the innocent party to sue out a divorce and after the divorce to marry another as if the offending party were dead. So there's two sentences here, and we'll address the first one. Adultery, fornication, committed after a contract. So we're talking about a, a betrothal, essentially. So they're not married, but you know, they're, they, they're engaged to be married. So if, if adultery, fornication is committed after that contract, after being detected before marriage, that gives just occasion to the innocent party to dissolve that contract. And, and the example that is referenced here is from Matthew chapter 1 with the birth narrative of, of Jesus. Um, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. So she's pregnant. And again, you know, Joseph doesn't know that she's praying by the Holy Spirit. And so verse 19, Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. So he was perfectly legal, you know, to, to end that contract, to, to end that betrothal, because at least in his mind at that point, she had an adulterous relationship. Even though they weren't married, 
they were betrothed to be married. And of course, we know, you know, verse 20, when he considered this, behold, an angel Lord appeared to him saying, Joseph, son David, do not be afraid. And, you know, goes on and talks about Jesus. But again, Joseph is basing his reaction in, in the reality that if, if there is a, a, an adulterous relationship within that betrothal, even though it's not marriage, it's still a form of adultery. And at that point, you know, you're, you're free. The innocent party is free to dissolve that, um, that contract. Now, in the case of adultery after marriage, says the confession, it is lawful for the innocent party to sue out divorce. Now, this course comes from Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, a couple other places. Jesus says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. And so here Jesus says, makes clear that immorality, sexual immorality, is a, a divorceable uh, offense. You know, that's, that's a one reason why you would, you could legally divorce, uh, your spouse. Now, Paul adds to it, uh, in first Corinthians chapter seven, verse 15, he says, if the unbelieving spouse leaves or abandons the believing spouse, let that one leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. So the Bible has two, uh, prescriptions on when a divorce is, is legal, adultery and abandonment. Um, now, how we define abandonment might, you know, abuse isn't listed on here, but it, it could be argued that abuse is a form of abandonment. Clearly that person who's abusing their spouse has, has abandoned, they don't care about them, even though they're still living together and perhaps providing for them, they don't care about their emotional, physical well-being because they're willing to, to abuse them either physically or mentally. And so they are, they, they are abandoned. And that's, that is a, a, an argument and, and we're using Dr. Sproul's book, Truths We Confess, and in that he mentions that that's something the church courts would have to uh, hash out and, and come to, this, to come to a decision on. Um, there's nothing unbiblical about that definition, but abandonment, you know, it has an idea of at least someone who is who's willing to leave a, an unbeliever. Uh, so those are the two cases that uh, adultery or the two cases, adultery and abandonment, are uh, biblically defined for uh, for the reason of divorce. Um, after divorce, says the Westminster Confession, it is lawful uh, to marry another as if the offending party were dead. Um, and so again, in, in light of that adulterous relationship, in light of that abandonment um, and that divorce that comes from that, the Westminster divines take from Romans chapter 7, verse 2, um, and, and sort of give it a positive spin on divorce. In Romans 7, Paul says, uh, For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while, she is, while he is living, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. Um, and so there's, you know, talking about the, the legal contract of marriage, how it's broken at death. Well, the Westminster Divines take that passage and they understand essentially when there's a legal divorce, it is essentially the death of, uh, of the spouse. And so that person is allowed to go on and, and, and remarry. Um, now, that's an interesting thing that they're willing to say that because Jesus does say, like I read in verse nine, or chapter 19 of Matthew, verse 9, he says, whoever divorces wife and marries another woman commits adultery. Um, and so Jesus seems to have this sense. But again, I think it's based on that doctrine of immorality and, and, adult, and abandonment there. Um, I certainly think Jesus would, would say that's not adultery if you, if you remarry uh, for that sense. But again, it's something that the Westminster divines take Paul in Romans 7, verse 2, and sort of transpose it to, to understand how, um, how divorce is, is to be understood. Um, so that's the, the question, that's the end of that article. We got five minutes. Any questions on that one? All right. So the last article here I've titled the unhasty in divorce. So article six says, although the corruption of man be such as is apt to study arguments unduly to put asunder those whom God hath joined together in marriage, yet nothing but adultery or such willful desertion as can no way be remedied by the church or civil magistrate is cause sufficient of dissolving the bond of marriage, wherein a public and orderly course of proceeding is to be observed, excuse me, and the persons concerned in it not left to their own wills and discretion in their own case. So the first part, everything before that colon is essentially carried over from Article 5, so it's the same thing again, talking about desertion or um, 
or adultery there. Um, I want to look at this last thing. So wherein, so a public and orderly course of proceeding is to be observed. So we know that divorce is allowed because Jesus tells us such. You know, divorce is allowed by God, but that doesn't necessarily mean it should be the first option. In Matthew chapter 19, this is that where Jesus talks about divorce. He says to them, why did Moses command to give her a certificate? Excuse me. They said to Jesus, why did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? Well, he says to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. So Jesus essentially telling, and I think we unpacked this when I came across this passage in Mark, uh, must have been earlier this year. Uh, Jesus is essentially saying, Divorce is not the way God intended. God did not design marriage so that it can be and should be broken. Um, now, God allows divorce because we're sinners. We have a hardness of heart. And in our sinfulness, we can abuse our partner, whether that's abuse is physical or adultery or abandonment or you know, however, however we want to try and define that. If, if that relationship is is harmful then in that case it can be dissolved because that's why divorce has been given so god essentially what 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 jesus is saying is here is marriage is a binding contract but that doesn't mean you need to stay in a relationship that is going to kill you, going to abuse you, going to, you know, you, you don't have to stay in an adulterous relationship. Dr. Sproul, uh, again, in his, in his book, he, he goes on and says, you know, the, if, if, use adultery for an example he uses. And he said that uh, the, if a husband has an adulterous relationship or commits adultery against his wife, well, one, you know, if they're both Christians, she has a duty to forgive him. That's something that Jesus says, we must forgive. But she also can have the option to divorce him because he has committed adultery against her. Uh, he clearly shows that he doesn't respect her or love her as Christ loves the church. And so while she must forgive him, she certainly can divorce him because he has broken that covenant relationship. Um, and so we see that uh, when we think about divorce, it, if the innocent party has the right to dissolve the marriage, that person probably should do it. And that person should not be ridiculed for doing so. Um, you know, that's the other thing. Too often, especially in, in our day and age, or maybe, maybe not so much in our day and age, but maybe 50 years ago, divorce was looked down upon, even divorce for adultery. Um, you know, some people would, would be, well, you got divorced? Well, why would you do that? Well, the Westminster Divines understand that divorce is, when it's taken, Proceeded, you know, publicly and orderly in the course of proceeding. You don't judge. That's not our place. If if they were lawful and, and innocent to do dissolve that marriage, they don't need to be ridiculed for doing it. So I want to conclude by just saying that both marriage and divorce are not to be entered into hastily. I think that's the point of that this article or this whole chapter tries to put across. And something that I would put across is that marriage and divorce are not to be entered into hastily. Um, now, you know, again, we need to think about our relationships. If we're gonna pursue a marriage relationship, think about your partner. Um, think about how that person, what they believe. Think about how they act. You know, there's, there's things that you need to consider. Is that person a suitable helper for you? And then divorce. Unless it's very clear adultery or, um, or, or abandonment, is this divorce really something that I need to do? Is this something that, is this, is the dissolution of this marriage really something that needs to happen? And so we need to think about both marriage and divorce as things that can't be jumped into hastily. And of course, that runs counter to everything that we see today. People are jumping into marriages and jumping out of marriages left and right. Um, you know, they, they fall in love and six months later they, they're married and sometimes it works out. I know people who, who've been married for 40, 50 years and they, their, their courting was only six months. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it shouldn't. Maybe, maybe you should take the time, you know, to, to have that betrothal period to, to understand and, and recognize and, and do, you know, Biblical courtship, that's something we don't talk about. But dating people 
should, you know, you don't just date people just to hang out with them. You're dating them to figure out where, what do they believe? Can, can, can this be a relationship that's long lasting? And too often, again, in society, we see that people are, are pursuing their passions. Oh, I, I just, I love this person. I just, I just love them so much. Well, why? Well, they make me feel happy. Where's God in that? We need to be, God needs to be included in the dating process. God just suddenly doesn't appear when you're married. No, God is also in the dating process too. Where's God in all that? So marriage and divorce aren't something that need to be jumped into hastily. Marriage is a covenant and it requires covenantal promises. Discussing those, think about that. Marriage requires forgiveness. So when there is wrong, but again, it can also be dissolved if that wrong severs the relationship. But again, that divorce shouldn't be jumped. Divorce needs to be the last option. Unless, again, like I said, there's adultery or abandonment or abuse, you know, then adultery, that, then divorce, yeah, that should happen. But if you're not getting along, if you're just fighting with one another, save divorce for the end. Go to marriage counseling. Have conversations. See if there's something that can be reconciled. If, if still, after years of trying to figure it out, it's still not working, then maybe at that point, you, you, it is time for a divorce. But divorce shouldn't be the first option, just like marriage shouldn't be the first option. You, you shouldn't, I don't think you need to jump into marriage six months after dating. I don't think you need to jump into divorce six months after fighting. Um, there's, there's, there, we, it takes a while to figure that out. We don't do those things hastily. All right, any questions? Well, I think it's Malachi. It says, God hates divorce. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that was the reference in the prayer. It, it was, um, uh, yeah, Malachi 2.11. It was, a number, it was letter G on there under 2, um, I think. Mm, no, maybe not. Anyway, I think it's in Malachi. Yeah. I believe you're right, though. Yeah. And certainly God, God hates it. God doesn't like that it happens. God hates all of our sins. Um, and, and so I think there's this recognition that, again, divorce is something, divorce I would say that divorce is a sin. Now, is it a sin that's going to send someone to hell? No, I don't think so. I think it's something that we need to not do. Now, if we do it, just like any sin, if we fall into it, if we fall into temptation, well, we need to seek forgiveness and go through it, just get done with it. And so that why, so again, I, I, I say divorce is a sin in the sense that it is it's something that God hates. And what does God hate? God hates things that are unrighteous. God hates things that are sinful. God allows divorce God, God allows us to do it because he recognizes that in this case, doing divorce, while it's something he hates, God also hates murder. God also hates adultery. God also hates anger. You know, there are other things that God also hates. And if all that stuff leads to divorce, then, then so be it. That's why we seek forgiveness. That's why there is forgiveness. Um, and so again, I don't think just because someone is divorced, they're going to hell because of that divorce. There's probably something else that might lead to going to hell, but I don't think divorce itself leads to hell, but it's something that God hates. It's something that God doesn't want us to jump into uh, because if we do, then essentially we're just saying his word doesn't matter and, and God's word always matters. All right, anything else? All right, well, let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for giving to us the institution of marriage. And Lord, while we look around the world around us and, and we see that it's being torn apart and stretched and twisted in ways that you do not command, I pray that you give us the strength, the fortitude to, to stand firm with the word, uh, to stand firm with your design for marriage. And Lord, I pray that um, while that is easier said than done, we also know that you call us to not have a spirit of timidity and fear, but a spirit of boldness, a spirit of power. And Lord, I pray that your spirit be with us as we look at our own marriages. Now, whenever there is strife, whenever there is discourse, if we've ever even flinted across the idea of divorce, Lord, I pray that you help us to, to wrestle with that. Um, let us not jump hastily into those things and let us consider our relationships with one another. Lord, I pray that we can expand this to just consider our relationships with everyone. How are we relating with others? How do we relate with our neighbor? Lord, I pray that in all these things, in all that we, we say and do and don't say and leave undone, Lord, I pray that we glorify your name, that we honor your name, and that we keep focus 
on your name. So Lord, we pray all this through Christ our Savior. Amen.